Hello, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful opportunity that we have to meet together, uh, to pray together, and to learn together. Encomendamos esta entrevista y la difusión y transmisión de este mensaje, de estos mensajes de Nuestra Señora del Carmel de Garabandal a ella misma. Iniciamos con una oración en latín, el Ave María, en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo, del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Ave María, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu et mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesús. Sancta María, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis pecatoribus nunc, et in hora mortis nostre. Amén. Nuestra Señora de Garabandal, ruega por nosotros. En el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Amén. We are very, very happy today. We have a wonderful guest with us today. Uh, his name is Glenn Hudson. Hello, Glenn. Hello. Glenn is, uh, I will say, a witness and an apostle of Nuestra Señora de Garabandal. He has been um, bringing the message to many uh, because um, him and, and I, and I'm, I'm sure most of you, believe the most important thing about Garabandal is the message. Uh, not so much the events and uh, trying to figure out things, but the message, what the lady told us uh, those times through uh, the little girls. So, um, uh, Glenn, I think that is a, a kind of a good introduction of yourself, other than uh, telling the audience that Glenn is in contact with Conchita. She is one of the uh, videntes, seers of Garavandal. Uh, they're very good personal close friends, and that Glenn uh, met Conchita and started all these apostolate of his through Joey Lomangino. So they were also friends, and he was a collaborator uh, at that time. Um, but uh, I will ask Glenn to tell us a little bit more about that during the interview. Um, for now, we can... Um, well, everybody knows about Garabandal in our channel, so there's no need to, to do a, a long history of it. But for those of you who don't know and you're joining us for the first time or, or finding this channel or this topic for the first time, uh, if you scroll down, we'll have a list of uh, several uh, amount of material about Garabandal, the two movies that were produced. One is a movie, the other one is a documentary, very, very well done and, and very informative, um, as well as some uh, testimonies from different priests, like uh, El, El Padre Jose Luis Saavedra. We have many videos there, so go and, and take a look at, at those. But um, uh, just to to recap really quickly, it's uh, Garabandal is an apparition that happened between the years 1961 and 1965. Uh, the Virgin Mary and, and the um, angel, first the angel and then the Virgin, appeared to four little girls, very innocent in heart, very pure. Their names are Conchita Gonzalez, Jacinta Gonzalez, Maricruz Gonzalez, and Mari Loli Mason. Uh, more than 2,000 apparitions in total. Uh, Glenn will correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken. Mm. Everything started the 18th of Ju June, 1961, when the angel appeared and announced that the Virgin was going to appear to the girls and speak to them the next day. And then it, it started, uh, Glenn will tell us more about that again. Uh, I'm just going to read the two main messages. I'll read them in Spanish, but then we'll have a translation in English on the screen. So the, the first one was uh, October 18, 1961. It is... I'm okay with my dates, right, Glenn? Yes? yes. Good. Um, the Virgin Mary said, Hay que hacer muchos sacrificios, mucha penitencia, visitar al Santísimo, pero antes tenemos que ser muy buenos. 
y si no lo hacemos, nos vendrá un castigo. Ya se está llenando la copa, y si no cambiamos, nos vendrá un castigo muy grande. Uh, then after this message and in between, uh, before this message and stuff, uh, the virgin appeared many times to them and it was really like a mother to them. That, that's pretty much it. Um, the virgin even played with them, taught them to pray the rosary. Uh, uh, simple things like that, but that contribute a lot to their lives. Uh, the second message was uh, the 18th of June, 1965. It's a, bit, it's a little bit longer. Again, I'll read it in Spanish really quickly. The translation will be on the screen. Um, and then this time it was San Michael the Archangel who delivered the message because it was a very strong message and the Virgin Mary didn't want to, um, I guess, upset the girls. And I mean, it was kind of the task delegated to the angel. Como no se ha cumplido y no se ha dado mucho a conocer mi mensaje del 18 de octubre de 1961, os diré que este es el último. Antes la copa se estaba llenando, ahora está rebosando. Muchos cardenales, obispos y sacerdotes van por el camino de la perdición. Y con ellos llevan muchas más almas. A la Eucaristía cada vez se le da menos importancia. Debéis evitar la ira del buen Dios sobre vosotros con vuestros esfuerzos. Si le pedís perdón con alma sincera, Él os perdonará. Yo, vuestra madre, por intercesión del ángel San Miguel... Os quiero decir que os enmendéis. Ya estáis en los últimos avisos. Os quiero mucho y no quiero vuestra condenación. Pedidnos sinceramente y nosotros os lo daremos. Debéis sacrificaros más. Pensad en la pasión de Jesús. Okay, I think I already spoke too much. Uh, I talked too much, and it, it's Glenn's turn to uh, to tell us many things about Garavandal. Um, by the way, it's it's a it's not a prohibited um, devotion or apparition, not prohibited by the church. It's kind of in the middle. It hasn't been approved as uh, having supernatural character, but it has never uh, been prohibited. I mean, it's not currently prohibited. Um, Glenn, again, will tell us more about this um, in a few minutes. So, Glenn, finally, I will let you speak and then the microphones will be yours. Um, tell us a little bit more about your, uh, I think it's close to 30 years of friendship with Conchita. Um, maybe give us some examples of her experiences of her character and things like that. Well, first, thank you for having me on. I appreciate uh this gift of being able to tell your audience about Garabandel in more detail. And um, so actually my participation started as a boy, as I had a uh, bone disease in my legs. And one of my aunts had Joey Lamanchino uh, coming to her house to talk about Garabandel in the 1970s. And my mother took me there and I venerated the medal that Mary kissed. And two weeks later, my legs were completely healed. Praise and this, yes, and, and the, the doctors were astonished. Because, you know, they confirmed this with x-rays. And I didn't see Joey for the next 20 years. Um, a friend of mine asked me to come to listen to a man speak about a, an apparition in Spain, a blind man. And I said, I, I'm not really interested. And he said, no, Glenn, you, you, you must come. He says, Padre Pio believes in this and supports it. And I go, well, if Padre Pio believes in it, okay, I'll listen to it. And I walk into Joey's house in Lindenhurst, New York, and I recognize him immediately as the man who I received the healing from, you know, from the metal, kissed metal. And uh, I tell my friend, I know him. And he goes, how could you know him? I said, I met him as a boy. So doesn't God work in funny ways? And, he um, does. He does. He surprises. Yeah. So I told Joey that um, I, I work mostly at night. Can I come and volunteer in the daytime? 
And I started working at the Garabandel Center in New York in 1993. And about two years later, uh, Joey saw that uh, I'm not exactly shy. And uh, I had read literally everything uh, that was printed about Garabandel. And I had you know, a lot of personal conversations with Regina. And so he made me the director of public relations for them. Wow. And uh, we were able to get on to uh, EWTN, Mother Angelica, and promote our video. And that's when it, you know, really started to take off. And then in 2009, I said, you know, Joey, I, I'm doing all these small talks around uh, people's homes and, and things, churches. I said, you know, I can do more sitting at home uh, on the computer with this new thing called Facebook. I said, I can reach around the world. So I actually started... Uh, with no members, uh, a Facebook page in English. And as of today, I now have 15 languages being posted daily and about a quarter of a million members. And, and it's growing every day. Um, so that's a little bit. Of, so I've been doing this, as you said, for, for 30 years now. And uh, Kijita and I uh, b both live in New York. We're about only about 15 minutes from each other. Um, actually, I'm, I'm stopping over her t house today after my interviews are done. Please uh, say hello to her for from all of us and uh, a big blessing to her and all her family. And um, it's it's fantastic to say in a few years that I've, you can say it. I've met a saint. Like you can think of uh, San oh, Bernadette and uh, really? uh, the the children of Fatima and Conchita is just that, right? Yes. Yes. To me, uh, to me, she's a living saint. And, and the reason I say that is because, you know, I've seen a lot of personal things that the, the average Garabandel supporter or believer ha will never have known unless someone tells them. So I'd like to maybe tell you one or two stories about her. Um, two of my favorites is when, when she came to America in 1972, um, she was brought here by a, a famous uh, doctor who also had a, a religious radio show, Dr. Dominguez. And he brought her over to America and he gave her a job in his medical office as uh, like an assistant. Um, and so Kachita, you know, can barely speak English. She has just a little bit. So every morning before work, she would stop and buy coffee for, for everyone in the office. And she get into an elevator to go to the office and a man stepped in and started asking her for money. And because her English wasn't so good, she didn't quite understand what he was saying. So she's offering him the coffee and he's getting upset and he pulls out a knife and he threatens her. Wow. But finally, he, she understands it's not the coffee, it's the money she wants. Now she opens up her purse and she only has $20 and she gives him the $20. But, and this is why I call her a living saint, she also tells the person, I'm also giving you a scapula to wear. And I want you to put this on. Who, who do you know would react to being threatened with your life by saying, here's my money, but are you, you're also going to wear the scapula? Trust so, in the Lord. Like nothing's going to happen. I'm protecting amazing. you and I'm going to protect you with this. Yeah. Wow. So that's just one, one story. Uh, probably my favorite story is my Christmas story. Um, you know, I, uh, I I speak to her a lot, and so this this Chris this past Christmas, I called her up Christmas week to see you know how she was doing in her family, and I said, you know, many many years ago, you told me you had a, a tradition in your family of a special kind of what uh, we call here a Kris Kringle, and that's where you pick the name of someone and you buy them a gift as a surprise, so they don't know who, who gave it to them. Well, Conchita does it in a way I've never heard of, and for any other family, what they do is on Thanksgiving night after dinner, they put all the names in a hat, and each person picks a name, and that person you do a rosary for every day of Advent until Christmas Day. And then on Christmas Day, you give them a mass card for their intentions, and that lets them know you've been praying for them for the entire Advent season. 
Oh, what an amazing yeah. story. We should all that, get uh, into that tradition. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never heard of anybody no. else. Because imagine telling your children, uh, no presents, here's a, here's a rosary for you. you know? <laughs> uh, but that, yeah. again, just, just two simple stories of you know how spiritual uh, she is and how her, she's raised her family this way. And, you know, it's no wonder to me that two of her closest friends were St. Padre Pio and St. Mother Teresa. And w whenever Mother Teresa was in New York, you know, she o would always stop by Conchita's house. Um, and, and they were very, uh, very close. And also her husband, uh, Patrick, was very close with Mother Teresa's order in New York. And he spent a lot of time, you know, volunteering for them. Um, so they had a very unique and close friendship. And I think everybody's heard the stories of how close, um, you know, Padre Pio was with her, that uh, he wrote her personal letters while in Garabandel. And um, even it's recorded that he bilocated uh, up to five times to Garabandel to see Conchita. So um, it's, it's a pretty good test of someone's validity and character, if you can say, two of my friends are Padre Pio and Mother Teresa. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, well, what else can you say of the character of a person? Absolutely. And, and she received the call of being a mom, a, 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 a family person. So many people will say, well, she didn't go to, to the convent. She tried. She wanted to, right? Uh, the, yeah. Yes. Do you Many, have anything to say to that? Yeah, many, many people, uh, that's their first complaint about Conchita's. Oh, she, she should have become a nun. And I said, well, you haven't really spent any time reading because at 16, she did uh, enter a convent to become a nun. And the person who told her that she shouldn't be there was Jesus himself. She had a locution in February and he said, did I ask you to come here? And, you know, and she responded, no. He says, I want you out in the world. You know, how else are these messages going to get out if, you know, if she's locked away in a convent? So she actually left the convent uh, and entered a boarding school uh, to finish her education. Uh, but that was on Jesus's request. And the funny thing is, so did uh, Jacinta. And Mary Lowley also entered convents. Wow. But in their time there, uh, they realized this is not their vocation, like you were pointing to. You know, people forget that just because you're not a nun doesn't mean you don't have a vocation in life. You know, be being a wife, being a mother, uh, being a grandmother, you know, all of these things are vocations. And, yes. and obviously by the stories that I've told you, the way she's raised her family, and, and what she's done to get these messages out, you know, she spent the first 20 years after the apparitions constantly doing interviews, television programs, uh, you know. So she fulfilled her vocation. And, and truly, the last piece of it will be she is going to give the world eight days notice of the miracle. And that will be, I think, the, the last of her obligations to her vocation. Yes, yes, absolutely. Wonderful vocation. Okay, with now that you've answered that first question and a little bit of the, the Padre Pio question that we had, I'm going to ask you, with, with this lovely character of not only Conchita, but all the seers, um, and the way the message is played out in Garabandal, and the faith, and the thousands of people that end up uh, going up there, very difficult to go, up um, very difficult road to to transit and everything. Um, many will say Garabandal is loved by many, but also sadly hated by many. So let's, if you if you want to say something to that, especially the commissions that were created, because for example here on our channel that's what we want to to hear. Not so much if it's true or not true. We I think. 90% of our audience believes that a vandal is true and is uh, of supernatural character. But why? Why was it treated the way that it was treated? And um, if you if you want to talk to that, we will appreciate it. Sure. 
Um, it's a bit of a long story, so um, I'll, I'll start where I don't think I'm, I think I'm the only person that, that talks about this in interviews because I've never heard another person talk about this before I started to mention it on my interviews. Yeah, but in, in Spanish, there is bueno, a few a few priests, but especially Padre Jose Luis Saavedra, if anybody wants to look it up online, we also have uh, videos of him on our playlist that I mentioned at the beginning. It's very important to know that it was, um, it was not treated right, and uh, yeah. that's why we don't have an approval. That's pretty much why we don't have an approval. Uh, yeah. So, yes, well, let, Glenn, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, let me explain why uh, that started. And this is the point that I was trying to make is uh, I'm, I, I think I'm the only person who brought up this point um, that nobody else has. The first the first bishop, Bishop Fernandez, had a judgment as soon as it started. And the reason was it goes back 30 years now in Spain in Esquiga, there were apparitions in 1931, and almost the same thing happened. Mary appeared to two children, and she gave almost the same exact messages of repentance, of a future miracle, and a possible chastisement. Now, unfortunately, during this time period of, of of, of almost two years, Spain was going through an election and uh, the socialists wound up uh, taking over. And they, you know, the first thing any socialist or communist wants is let's, let's replace religion with government rule. And they wanted this apparition squashed. And they basically told the Jesuits, stop preaching about this apparition. And they didn't. And as it started to gain more and more uh, fame, they literally told the Jesuits, if you don't st uh, condemn this apparition, we'll just start killing you. I, so, I, I don't doubt it. Yeah, the Freemasons yeah. are just like that. And they, they yeah. enter through communism and they're capable of horrendous things. So the apparition, unfortunately, was condemned. And then people forgot about it. Now, isn't it interesting that 30 years later, 1961, Mary comes back now. And, and bigger and stronger and, and more forceful with her messages. But this bishop is so fearful that he's going to have the chaos that happened 30 years earlier. He's already made up his mind. He's going he's gonna to put an end to this. So the first commission that's appointed is, is basically a joke. It's, it's for the sole purpose of condemning the apparitions. And it's over time, it's so bad, it's so obvious what his intention is. The man who's the brigadier general of the army of the civil guard, uh, Seco, he says in public, in writing, this is a farce this commission. And I'll, and I'll give examples of why he said it's a farce. First of all, the, what would be the first thing you would do if you're having a commission investigate these girls? You interview, interview the, girl. the girls. <laughs> no, no interviews with the girls, no interviews with their parents or relatives or anyone who believes. They only record those who are questioning the apparitions and don't believe. So that's the first problem. The second one is he appoints doctors, three doctors, to help convince people that the apparitions are false. And what happens is Mary turns the tables on them because the more that they try to condemn and prove that they're fake, they wind up proving the apparitions are true. So the first thing is when the girls go into it an ecstatic state, um, they take on uh, a, a different presence. So they're impervious to pain. So you see them fall to their knees on jagged rocks and there's no expression of pain and there's no damage to their legs. No cuts, no bleeding. That's the first sign. So then they said, well, we'll try pinching the girls while they're in ecstasy and they feel no pain. Well, then they go to like pins. They stick them with pins and they still feel no pain. They get so desperate that they try to burn them with matches 
But that gets no reaction from the girls. And and they're so upset that they actually t two men try to pick up the girl and move her. And it's, they testify that she's like bolted to the ground. Two grown men can't pick up an 11-year-old girl. Now, this starts to, like I said, confirm that there's a heavenly presence there, that Mary is there, because these things Absolutely. are undeniable. Absolutely. You know, the, the ecstatic walks over these this terrible mountain terrain filled with rocks where the girls never look down. They always look up at Mary and they can walk forwards or backwards or any way unharmed, never tripping, never falling. So now the commission is so mad that they're, they're desperate to, they, they see that Kajita is kind of like the, uh, the the leader almost. Mary spends a lot of time with Conchita in particular. So they actually take Conchita, who's 12 years old, from her house and bring her to a beach town without any supervision. No parent, no relatives, no priest. She's alone. Imagine how terrified your daughter would be at 11 years old. And, you know, these are simple mountain girls. You know, this is a this is a quiet, simple mountain town, no electricity. They take her out of the town and they start to threaten her. And they say to her, listen, you're going to sign this piece of paper that says that you're lying. You made up the story. And if you don't, when you go back, we're going to put your mother in jail or we'll put you in jail or we'll put you in an insane asylum. This is an 11 year old girl. They're so, she's still adamant about defending the apparitions that at one point, the doctor is so desperate, he cuts off most of her hair. And I have the pictures on my website, uh, if people want to see it, how long her hair was, the braids, you know, go down her back. And when she came back, it was like uh, below her ears. They thought her hair had magical powers. So they cut off her hair. So the last act of, of how desperate this doctor is, one of them, he tries to hypnotize Conchita. And at the instant he starts speaking, Mary appears to Conchita <laughs> and she goes into an ecstatic state and hears nothing. No, well. So, you know, the last, the last condemning thing is people say, well, they condemned it. I said, well, really? I said, well, why was there never a report sent to the Vatican? So there's your proof be, that this was not condemned. That's the first thing you want to know. It was never condemned because this was a false commission and no report was ever filed with the Vatican. And you can check because I've gone through the Vatican documents and they had nothing to file. So this started the confusion with a lot of people. Now, in 1966 in January, Pope Paul has heard all of these stories about Garabandel and this and that, and he invites Conchita to the Vatican. And she's interviewed by Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Adovayani for two and a half hours. And he's so convinced at the end that he not only blesses her, but he says, I'm going to set up a private audience for you to meet the Pope. So Conchita and her mother and a few people that were with them, I have a private audience with Pope Paul VI. She tells her story again. He believes her and says to her, Conchita, I bless you and the whole church blesses you. So now the church itself is in a little bit of a problem because they have the bishop saying one thing and the Pope saying another so the church is very specific on apparition uh, categories. There's, it's approved, it's not approved, and then there's one called non-constat, and its full name is non-constat to supernatural Tate. <laughs> and what that means is we're not sure if there's a supernatural uh, happening here. Exactly, and, that's it. We are not sure, and it's still open right. to to further evidence and stuff. That's yes. the status, yeah. And more more comes. Um, so I want to add that um, with that, you know, the apparitions were still allowed to be um, uh, investigated by people uh, w with no condemnation. Um, now, the, one of the funny things is 
remember I told you about the fake commission that was set up? Yes. Well, well, the bishop appointed a priest, Father Del Vel Gallo, to head up this commission. He's so convinced by what he sees, he quits the commission. And, and by the fate of God, he later becomes the bishop of Santander. So he reopens a new investigation. And in 1988, that report is sent to the Vatican, to um, the Sacred Congregation for the, um, the Doctrine of the Faith. And who's the head of that? Cardinal Ratzinger, who we all know is was Pope Benedict XVI. So it's interesting that the only official report with the Vatican is is that one that came from Bishop Del Gallo. Yes. Um, and so that's why it's still an open book as far as the Vatican is concerned. Yes. Now, during, during Conchita's visit, she did tell the Pope the date of the future miracle. So now the coach, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the church in its uh, wisdom is saying, you know what, we're going to be prudent. We're not going to make a ruling. We're going to wait to that date. And if the miracle happens, then we can approve it. <laughs> yes, and so, I am I, convinced, and, and I think many in our mm -hmm. audience too, that many of the popes do believe in Garavandal or believed. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Paul VI, um, uh, John Paul II, Saint John Paul II too. Um, yes, he was very vocal. Uh, Benedict and the 16, because when you leave that open, it's like saying, hey, please keep investigating, right? Yeah. So he, um, he believed, he he received that report. And I believe in that report, there was a um, um, an statement from one of the doctors, if I'm not mistaken, saying, I acted wrongly. I did the wrong thing back then. I am sorry. And the apparitions are true. That's Dr. Morales. Remember yeah. I told you, the one who tried to hypnotize Conchita? Yes, he changed that his mind Dr. and Morales. he changed his testimony. Yes, um, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And now we know why it is so hated by many because it was, they did it on purpose. Yeah. So that many will start questioning and. Okay, thanks for all of that. Um, another very interesting question. It kind of has three components. You can speak to one or two, all three. Um, we believe that uh, the central themes of El, uh, the message of Garavandal are, number one, conversion, the call to conversion and to repent. Number two, the Eucharist. The Eucharist. It said it in the message and in the many ways that uh, she interacted with the girls and the angel too, the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist. And number three, the priesthood. Uh, would you agree with that? That those are kind of the main three um, themes of uh, El Mensaje de Garavandal? Yes, they, they are the main themes. And, you know, the, the most interesting thing to me is when people say negative things about Garabandel, I said, ask yourself this. The first thing Mary did, what did she do? She taught the girls the rosary. Okay? So how is it that you have a problem with this when the first thing that she talks about is the importance of the rosary? You know? And then the, the, the next important thing she tackles is respect for the Eucharist, because she says less and less importance is given to the Eucharist. So now you have the Rosary, you have the Eucharist, and then she also talks about just your daily life, how to conduct yourself in everyday life. And, you know, she says, just lead good lives. You know, just lead good lives. You know, you know what, you know, life is, can be very simple, really, if, if we think about it. We know what to do. We, you know, we know what's right and wrong. Mary emphasized these things over the course of the four years. You know, she talked about, you know, modesty, humility, obedience, all of these wonderful daily things that people seem to forget about. And, and she isn't asking for anything, you know, uh, overly complicated from us. But um, I, I, I think those most important things 
uh, have become now central for me in my life, which is daily mass, you know, and communion, uh, frequent confession. Uh, I try to go every two weeks if I can. And, and a daily rosary is a must. And it was funny, many, many years ago, uh, this was decades ago, you know, I was very busy and I had developed three businesses and was running them all at the same time. And, you know, I'm talking to Kachita one day and, and, and we're just in regular conversation like friends do. And she's asking me how I am. She goes, Oh, you look tired. I said, yeah. She goes, but are you doing your rosary every day? I said, you know, I, I, I work so hard. Uh, I, I don't have time every day. And then she looked me in the face and said, don't promote the rose, uh, don't promote the uh, apparitions if you don't do the rosary every day. And I was shocked. I'm like, wow, you know, uh, I'm working hard and I'm working for the apostolate heart. You know, that's how important it is, you know, to Mary and to her. And so, you know, I, I, it's a daily part of my life now. Fantastic. Yeah, it is. If you think of it, it is simple. It is simple. And so many people were expecting messages uh, like out of whatever space or something. And it's just be a good Catholic. Um, the fact that she appears sometimes with the scapular, it's, uh, I don't think she said it, but I think it's saying it. Wear your scapular, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, she appeared as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And there's obvious, and many of the, many of the appearances were with the baby Jesus and, and the scapular off her arm. So, you know, the picture is worth a thousand words. Exactly. Wear it, wear it. Wonderful promises with the brown scapular. Um, Glenn, will you touch on the fact, uh, that, uh, Conchita's friends are saints? <laughs> One of them, Padre Pio. Um, I remember you saying at, uh, some point that, he left some things for her. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that other than sure. the letters that, that he wrote? Yeah, I, I think one of the most uh, validating acts uh, of Conchita uh, and, and what she says is true is not only her friendship with Padre Pio, but upon his death, of all the people in the world, he chooses Conchita to leave his personal rosary, his one of his bloodstained gloves, and the, part of the bandage uh, for that glove, um, and the veil that covered his face during his wake. So it's amazing to me that, of, like I said, all the people in the world that he must have known, and, you know, popes and cardinals and bishops and he chooses Conchita to leave these most personal gifts, and um, she she still has them to this day. I, I've seen all of them uh, in her home. Ah, oh, that, that that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Glenn. Mm, I think uh, I mean there is so many more things to to talk about the actual messages and apparitions and everything, but. Uh, Our Lady also left um, kind of a detail, a little bit detail, three future events that will happen. Uh, so many people are confused which one comes first. And uh, if you want to speak to to any of these or to all three, uh, that will be great. One is El Aviso, the warning. Uh, the next one is El Milagro, the miracle. And the last one is the chastisement, El Castigo, or El uh, conditional chastisement. So if, if you can um, enlighten us a little bit more of, of with the details that you know. Sure. Uh, I'll discuss all three uh, because all three are very important. So let's start with the warning. Mary actually gave Conchita some clues as to when the warning would be approaching soon. So we have these three events that she talked about. The first one was an important synod. So that's important because I believe now the one that's ongoing may be the most important synod of all because so many radical topics are being discussed and there's so much controversy going on. Um, it's my personal opinion that this is the synod uh, that Mary referred to. No doubt. I, I think the same, yes. The, the second 
was she said when communism comes again now think about this what confuses people in the 60s was they would they would say to Conchita what do you mean when communism comes again it's where's it going so in the 1960s communism wasn't going anywhere but look what happened you know uh, the Soviet Union did disband technically and but you can see how communism has uh, re-entered many countries throughout the world, even here in America, which which shocked me. I never thought you would see socialist and communist ideas, um, you know, being being implemented, um, you know, in a place that's supposed to be about freedom and democracy. So it, it's a little scary because, you know, you just look around the world and you can see communism has come back. Very scary. Um, yeah, even China, they're closing Catholic churches in China. And um, the last sign would be the Pope would return from Moscow and hostilities would break out in Europe. So now an interesting fact is that no Pope has ever been to Moscow. And people obviously are aware that Pope uh, Francis has been asking lately uh continually for an invitation because you have to be invited yes what people what people don't realize is i believe that he knows this garabandel prophecy uh, i believe that this information was handed down from pope to pope and the reason i say that is i follow uh his doings very carefully and closely he's not been asking just for the last few months he's been asking for the last six years to go to, to moscow to go to Moscow, all the way back in 2017, he started to ask. And, and this invitation can only come from either Putin or Patriarch Kirill of, uh, you know, the Church of Moscow. So I believe that those three signs, and we have the two of them already, the Synod, and you have the return of communism. Um, and and I think the Pope has already been invited to Moscow, right? Because he, he no. mentioned not yet, not officially. No. He, he said that I will, I will not retire or step down until I get an invitation. So he's still waiting for it, but um, it, it sounds like they're working on it now. It sounds like the Vatican is quietly working on trying to get this done this year. So those are the three signs before the warning, okay? And then sometime after the third, the warning comes. Now, the warning itself is is God's really last act of mercy for us. And what he's going to perform is an incredible miracle. He's going to sus suspend time. He's going to suspend time and allow each person to see their soul as he sees it. To see your sins and the gravity of those sins as he sees it. You know, we all think we're pretty good people and, you know, um, I'm, I'm not a bad person. Uh, what God sees is completely different because he sees every little act. So it's not only that you're going to learn the gravity of your sins, but you're going to also see sins of omission, things that you should have done or could have done and didn't do, and the harm that you cause to people in your acts. Now, Catholics will say to me right away, I've been to confession, I'm forgiven, I don't have to worry about it. And, and I correct them gently and say, you're in for a surprise. <laughs> yes, exactly. Also because there is a, a penalty to pay. That's why purgatory exists, right? Right. Your sins and, are forgiven and, um, and the sin is erased, but you still have to uh, reestablish what, what went wrong. Like you, you break a window and your neighbor forgives you. That that's your sin. It has been forgiven, but you still need to replace that window, and that's right. what happens in in purgatory. Absolutely. So I and I even challenge people who are put up more of an argument. I said, I explain to me the difference. How does God see um, you using foul language and stealing something? What's the difference? Which is worse? And they say, well, well, I, I don't know. And I say, ah, exactly. Only he's, God going, <laughs> he's going to show you the gravity of all of these sins, how it offends him. So, and I tell people, 
think about this for a second, and, and then because people get very fearful of the warning, and, and rightfully so. It's, it's going to be unpleasant for all of us. But I said, think about this. Think about this gift that's coming. You're going to have a piece of God's knowledge, very small piece, but you're going to know something that God knows, which to me is, is an enormous blessing. So, so the warning, you know, be prepared. It's going to be difficult. And, you know, it's meant to, so that you make changes in your life. Now, to confirm that the, the warning is from God, he's going to bring a physical miracle back in Garabandel. And Kachita is going to announce this eight days in advance so that the world is prepared for it. Now, one of Mary's promises was that anyone in attendance uh, in, in, the, uh, in the region of Garabandel, there, that mountain area, anyone in attendance will receive a healing for whatever ailment there is. Now, the, the miracle itself is uh, two stages. Uh, there's approximately a 15-minute event that happens at the Pines, and then that will change into a permanent sign forever, and God is going to leave it there. And that's his sign that everything you experience during the warning is backed up now because of this physical miracle. And Mary said it will be undeniable that it's, you know, it's, it's from God and her son. So you have your confirmation. Of, of what you just learned. Now, Mary also said there's going to be a conditional chastisement. And, sorry, and I sorry emphasize to the word we, conditional. Sorry to interrupt you, Glenn. Between uh, el aviso y el, milag y el milagro, the, the warning and the miracle, uh, there will be less than a year. Oh, our mother said within a year or something like that. Am I correct? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll even define it even uh, for you even more. Um, through my years of research, of interviews and, and personal conversations, uh, my personal opinion is that it's going to happen in the month of April. Now, Mary Lowley did say within a year, but she also said in a 1975 interview, the same year. And... They said, how do you know that? And she said, the Blessed Mother told me. Um, and if you come to uh, one of my websites, I'll, I'll show you the exact interview where it was said. So that narrows down the time period. So if, if, I'm, if I feel that the miracle will be in the month of April and they happen in the same year, that means the warning should happen between January 1st and you know, uh, March 31st, let's say. Um, so that kind of closes that gap. Instead of 12 months, it's it's down to three months or less before the miracle. Okay, so a few months or even a few weeks. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the miracle, so the, Conchita knows the exact day uh, and yes. she knows some other details, what day of the week is going to be and stuff. She has mentioned that before to you. Yes, she told us it's going to be on a Thursday night at 8.30 Spanish time. Um, and it will be on the feast of a young martyr, a young male martyr of the Eucharist. Okay, thank you. And you were going to continue. So after the miracle? So God is going to allow uh, mankind uh, a certain amount of time, which we don't know. Um, I've heard a million different explanations from other visionaries, so I stick with what I know. And there was no time period given at Garabandel. So I don't know if it's weeks, months, years, but he's going to give the world a chance to repent and to convert and change their lives. Now, I always say it's the conditional chastisement because that punishment can be mitigated through repentance. So it's very important for people to realize this, that not only do you have to repent, but you have to keep it up. You know, I, I always, I'm fearful that it's like a New Year's Day resolution where people make a resolution and then a couple of weeks or months later, they, they go back to what they used to do. And, that, and that's what scares me might happen is people are going through a great conversion after the miracle 
But how long do they stay on that that holy road, you know, or that road for holiness? Perseverance, um, yeah, that's what is right. Needed. So, you know, my 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 personal warning to your audience is, you know, it convert, repent, and and stay with it because if we don't, we're facing a very fierce uh, chastisement. Now, there were only two comments, one by Conchita and one by Mary Lowley, as to a description of it. And, and they're, they're pretty horrific. Um, Conchita's description was, it was worse than being enveloped by fire from above and below. And Mary Lowley said that it was like there was a lake of fire. So, pretty, pretty terrible. Pretty terrible. Um, some people um, intertwine, relate uh, this chastisement, conditional chastisement, to the three days of, of darkness. We, we really don't know, but it seems to be that way, right? Yeah, I, I've read other uh, visionaries' uh, descriptions of it, and um, the word that's always common through all of them is fire. So they all have the same basic description. Um, some are slightly different, but they all include that main issue of fire. So, uh, again, my personal opinion would be that the three days of darkness that's referred to in other apparitions, it was never called that at Garabandel, it was called the conditional chastisement, that they are the same event. It's, it seems that way. Thank you, Glenn. Well, um, you cannot mm -hmm. uh, imagine how much we appreciate having you here and telling us all of this and sharing all of these wonderful experiences, uh, truths, insights with us and, and our audience. Um, is there anything else, Glenn? Perhaps um, you can tell us, um, I don't know, how the Holy Spirit is moving you uh, throughout this conversation uh, for our audience to uh, to hear anything else from you regarding uh, the seers, the, the message, the La Virgen de Garabandal or you anything that, so that we can uh, close our nice conversation. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to leave you with, with two things to think about. And, and they're simple things. The, the, the most basic thing that Mary said, which I said before, was she said, lead good lives. And it's pretty simple. And, you know, Conchita said, it's not important to believe in the apparitions. But it's important to live the messages. So Mary and Conchita are both saying the same thing. She gave us the tools. She told us what she expects from us on how to live. Frequent mass and communion. Frequent confession. Do the rosary. Wear the scapula. Lead good lives. Simple instructions, and, and and like I said, Conchita backs it up by saying, I don't even care if you believe in the apparitions. <laughs> Just live the messages, because that's really the whole point. The whole point is that you believe and that you, you help your family to understand what God and, and the Blessed Mother are talking about. And this is going to be God's last act of mercy for us. So that's why, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so adamant about these simple things. You don't have to do a lot of studying and this and that. Just follow those simple things that Mary asked and you and your family will be safe. That is wonderful, Glenn. That is wonderful. And uh, so much to learn about uh, Garabandal and El Mensaje, the messages. Um, you have a collection of wonderful materials and uh, reflections and documents um, in, in a page. Uh, I, I believe it's a website. Many people don't have Facebook, so but they can contact you somehow through Facebook and you have a website. Um, but also uh, on the description of the video uh, down below, I'm going to put the link to your website, uh, to your Facebook group um, where, I mean, uh, 
so much material you can find there and learn and share with others. It, I think, is really important. And perhaps in the future you, you will open a Telegram channel or something where we can have more people joining and uh, people who don't use Facebook per se. Yeah, I, uh, I also write for a separate private site um, that my friend has. It's called Mother of God. Um, but I'll, I'll send you the link because they spell it a little bit different because there's two sites with the same name. Okay. Um, and also, your audience should know that, like I said, uh, it's not only the English page. There's also, it's 15 different languages. So uh, obviously there's a Spanish page and, and, and many other languages if they don't speak English. What a wonderful work you and, and all your collaborators do. We, we, we can't thank you enough. And uh, we will be praying for you, for, for your group, for Conchita. Uh, please let her know that we are always praying for, for her and, uh, and, and your mission. And, and, and now our mission our mission if you're listening to this it's not a coincidence um share it you can share this video you can share glenn's uh facebook page just just share it because so many people i mean the whole world needs to know about these messages and, and the importance of living our catholic faith and, uh, and the conversions that are happening at garavandal are just huge uh the fruits don't stop coming like um, there is um, peregrinaciones, or pilgrimage, pilgrimage, conversions um, every week, just uh, fantastic things happening for humanity through uh, Nuestra Señora de Garabandal. Muchas gracias a todos por escucharnos. Thank you very much for joining today. Thank you, Glenn, uh, for this wonderful time that you have given us. You're such a busy person, but you don't hesitate to say yes to these interviews and and that is just that is just fantastic it's my yeah. pleasure it's my pleasure god bless thank you, you thank you so much bye bye god if bless. we can finish uh, maybe with the sign of the cross mm -hmm. in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen thank you everybody just talk about garavandal just share the message <laughs>